Okay, moving on, we are going to, um, and look at that, we are right on schedule. Amazing. Um, we're going to uh, look at biotoxins, trace elements, and microplastics. I know we've been getting some questions in the audience about, oh, if the sunfish are eating jellies, um, aren't they aren't they probably mistaking jellies, um, plastics in the ocean for jellies? And um, and interestingly, I, I do want to do a shout out to um, Krill Carson and her citizen science um, sighting space, the New England Alliance, uh, her um, basking shark and ocean sunfish project. And in um, Massachusetts, they have a very robust citizen science program there and have been for, for years. And um, and they they do a lot of mola dissections and have never found plastic bags in in molas. And um, the ones I've not found plastic bags either. But Miguel has done has looked at some microplastics for his PhD and Katya as well and biotoxins. So that's what we're going to be diving into next with Katya and Miguel. So if I'd love I'd love to get you guys on screen. Yeah. And I think Miguel, um, hi, 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 you guys. Um, Miguel, we met earlier. Um, yes. Good to see you back. Yes. Good and to see you again, too. I hope I got yes. that right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, you are a PhD student in um, Lisboa, studying yeah. the rare earth elements of marine organisms in a changing ocean. And, um, and you worked with Miguel on this chapter and in this work. So the two of you, I'm happy to have you both. Um, we're so, so delighted you guys could both join and co-present. So we'll hand it right over to you. <laughs> Thank you, it's our pleasure. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, I'll just... If you could start showing. In a minute. Sure. Uh, okay. 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 So I'm gonna start um, by talking to you a little bit about uh, um, contaminants uh, to uh, explain the origin of this chapter. So any any substance. For example, metals, hormones, or even drugs can become a contaminant when it occurs at a significantly higher concentration than the natural background level in a particular area or organism. And they can exist both naturally or introduced by human activities. And the contaminant then becomes a pollutant if it produces harmful effects for ecosystems. And these contaminants may be bioaccumulated, and some of them have the potential to be bi biomagnified along marine food webs. And this means that top predators can contain contaminants several orders of magnitude greater than those found in lower trophic levels. And owing to public health concerns, most contaminant studies are conducted on economically important species. Therefore, some fishes have received considerably less attention. However, they are far of being worth less due to its broad worldwide distribution and key role in both temperate and tropical food webs. So we reviewed all available information on three types of contaminants known to occur in ocean sun species, biotoxins, trace elements, and microplastics. Regarding biotoxins, fish of the order tetrodontiforms are generally associated with biotoxins that are potent neurotoxins, namely tetrodotoxin, TTX, and pilotoxin, PTX. TTX is mostly known in pufferfish, but is also found in other organisms and amphibians. And TTX blocks sodium channels, which can cause paralysis and respiratory failure, failure. And PTX can block the sodium potassium ATPase pump and also acts as a hemolysin, which destroys red blood cells, which in turn has obviously severe deleterious effects. 
However, to date, only two studies investigated its presence. Next slide. Um, to, on ocean sunfish species. And only one investigated PTX. Neither found them on Masturus lanceolatus and Rosania levis. And these two studies are uh, not recent. One is from 1991 and the other one is from 2011. And recently, a more sensitive chemical method is being used to evaluate the presence of TTX in mola species from the Portuguese coast. And so far, preliminary results indicate that it is not present in liver, white, and red muscle. However, an incident occurred in Taiwan after a couple of persons ate Masturus lanceolatus muscle and exhibited severe food poisoning symptoms. And uh, an hemolytic assay suggested the presence of a PTX-like compound, which highlights the need to further study their presence on molar specimens. Go, Miguel. An hemolytic assay suggested the presence of a PTX-like compound, which highlights the need to further study their presence on all the specimens. Go, Miguel. It serves a biological function, and uh, like iron or zinc, and the non-essential when no biological function is evident, like mercury or lead. Uh, either essential or non-essential trace elements can have um, deleterious effects on the organisms depending on their levels. So concentration of trace elements is affected by sex, size, uh, diet, habitat, or season. To date, um, or to this day, uh, eight works have been conducted on the trace element concentration of mole uh, and mole species, and one on the concentration of Masturus lanceolatus. We're going to talk about these results. Regarding mall species, we're going to talk about sex-related differences, elemental distribution within tissues, the body size effect, and the season effect. And regarding the mustoos, we're going to talk about elemental distribution within tissues. So in terms of sex-related differences, we found that um, they were only found in the gonads, uh, likely because of ovaries and testes are biochemical and structural difference, uh, have biochemical and structural differences. The ovaries, zinc, manganese, and copper were found in higher concentration than in testes. Uh, this is an uh, expected result since uh, these are essential uh, elements and likely important for the embryonic development. In testes, vanadium was found in higher concentration. It's a non-essential uh, element, but likely it just had a high affinity to the tissue. In terms of distribution within tissues, we can see that the elements in higher concentration overall were zinc and, uh, and arsenic. Uh, zinc is an essential element, uh, vital in fish physiology, involved in many enzymes. And arsenic, on the other hand, is not essential. Uh, however, it is known that fish that consume crustaceans and seaweed have high levels of this element. And most species are consume both these both types of um, food. Um, the elements with lower concentration were cadmium and lead. They are both non-essential, so it's a natural result. Uh, it was, it was, we found uh, considerable inter-individual variability in the elemental concentration, uh, meaning that for any element in any given tissue, as we can see in the box plots, there was a huge variation between the lower and highest um, contents. Yes, uh, this should occur due to the mixed diet, uh, because mole eats both pentic and pelagic uh, prey, which have the varying elemental content. We found differences between, between, uh, between tissues. For example, we can see here on the top left corner that for manganese, the gills were the element exhibiting, or the tissue exhibiting higher concentration, whereas the hypodermis and the white muscle exhibited the lowest concentrations. Total elemental content um, was also looked at. We found that the tissues exhibiting highest uh, total amount of trace elements were the liver um, and the gills. 
These are natural results because the liver uh, has a, um, a function of detoxification and storage of trace elements, whereas the gills in immediate contact with surrounding water um, is prone to accumulate higher elemental levels. On the other hand, the tissues exhibiting lowest accumulation were the brain, which is protected by the blood-brain barrier, and the hypodermis and white muscle, which having a, should have a minimal function in, meta in metabolism, so they should accumulate small amounts of um, contaminants. Interestingly, we found the difference between the red muscle and the white muscle. These muscles have different roles in locomotion. One is responsible for fast movements, the other one for slow swimming. So they have phys uh, different physiological adaptations. The white muscle relies on anaerobic metabolism, the red muscle aerobic metabolism, and therefore they should have different elemental requirements. In terms of body size, different results were observed depending on the tissue or, um, or element. However, the most common result was a decrease in the trace element concentration with an increase in body size. As you can see here in these graphs, um, as the fish grow, trace element concentration decreases. As you know, um, molars are an incredible animal and they, they grow extremely fast. So if there's a rapid increase in tissue volume, even though they are accumulating trace elements, there should be dilution effects and overall you see a decrease in the concentration. In terms of season, again, as with body size, there was different um, results observed. And with the higher levels being found in either season, autumn or spring, the differences in seasonal um, concentration were mostly found in the liver and less common in the gills, white muscle and red muscle. These, these uh, results should have to do with, um, with the fact that different tissues exhibit different turnover rates. Um, in, in liver, a, a common result was a higher concentration in autumn. Um, which should indicate uh, an elemental, greater elemental uptake on a relatively recent period because the liver has a very fast turnover. On opposition in the gills, there was no effect, uh, almost no effect, no, no difference in season, which should indicate a similarity in waterborne elemental content. Meaning that if there was an increase in the, um, if, if in autumn you have a higher uh, content than in spring, it should mean that Molars were eating different prey during the seasonal migration between uh, spring and autumn, and these prey would have higher levels of trace elements. With uh, regard to Masturus lanceolatus, uh, it was found that the highest mean concentrations of trace elements, of essential trace elements, were found for iron, zinc, selenium, and copper, whereas for non essential elements, the higher ones were arsenic, cadmium, and mercury. The tissues with highest mean concentrations were the liver, kidney, and spleen, a natural result since they have a role in filtration, excretion, storage, and detoxification of elements. And similarly to what we just observed, the tissue with the lowest mean concentrations was the muscle, which should have a minimal function in metabolism. By comparing all oceans and fishes, um, first we're going to talk about mollusk species um, from three ge different ge geographical locations, Florida, Portugal, and Mediterranean Sea. We can see that overall, uh, both essential and non-essential trace elements were found in greater levels in the Mediterranean uh, specimens. This is a normal result since Mediterranean is known to be a sea uh, with heavy um, pollution. Still, four of the specimens exhibited a greater concentration of selenium and mercury in the kidney. When comparing molars and uh, mastodolanceolates from the same uh, geographical region, uh, in this case Florida, we found phylogenetic related differences in elemental dynamics. We can see that um, mole species exhibit overall greater elemental concentration in the gills, um, yet greater values of iron greater were found in Mastura lanceolatus and greater values of arsenic in uh, mole species. And now back to you, Katia. Uh, thank, thank you. So as you know, uh, plastics are one of the most popular materials used worldwide. And this leads to great amounts of pollution caused by plastic debris, even including those pieces that are not visible to naked eye, like microplastics. So my, microplastics are synthetic particles or polymers that range from one micrometer to five millimeters and are insoluble in water. And they can be consumed through direct ingestion 
or indirectly by ingesting a previously contaminated prey. In 2018, Niegaard described a small polystyrene ball in the digestive tract of Molatecta, which demonstrated the need to evaluate the presence of microplastics in Molide. So we conducted a study by collecting 53 stomach contacts of Mola specimens off the coast of Olhão in southern Portugal. And after digestion, the particles were categorized by color, by size classes, and fibers were distinguished from other types of particles as they tend to be the great majority of microplastics found. And this is the first comprehensive study on microplastics in MOLA species. So, uh, next slide. So, therefore, comparison can only be made to other uh, species. Out of the 53 studied stomach contents, 79% presented potential microplastics. And these numbers are in line to other uh, fish species in Portuguese coast and estuaries. However, curiously, fibers and other fragments were equally distributed, approximately 50-50%, which is not in accordance with literature, as I told you in the previous slide. This could be explained by the shift in mola species feeding habits. They shift from coastal benthic to more oceanic pelagic prey as they grow, and the, and the sampled specimens here could still be ingesting benthic species that in turn ingest more fibers than pelagic ones. And color is considered to play a role in microplastics ingestion due to prey resemblance, and blue was the most common, constituting 43% which is also in line with other uh, fishes in the same location. So we argue that selective ingest ingestion seems to be unlikely, also because the overall sizes of the microplastics were very small, which may indicate that they are, they are being incorporated indirectly, either by ingesting prey that is already contaminated or even through water. And although we did not find difference, found differences between sampling seasons, we saw that females presented significantly higher amounts of microplastics than males. And this does, does not seem to make sense from an ecological point of view. To the best of our knowledge, male and female do not present different feeding habits. And then additionally, the studied specimens were immature. So perhaps with a greater sample size, this difference would not exist, even though 53 is not a small uh, sample size. Other studies have described the potential effects of microplastics in fish, uh, and they can be, for example, physical abrasion along the feeding tract, inflammatory responses, and even nutritional disturbances. So the effects of the presence of the macroplastics that we've shown here need to be further investigated. And to conclude, uh, we saw that further research is needed to clarify the presence of biotoxins. Also, Miguel presented a great baseline for trace elements, but is limited to the Atlantic Ocean, so data is missing from other regions in the world. And only one study explored the presence of microplastic, in, microplastics in MOLA species, and again, just in southern Portugal. And this highlights the great deficits of information regarding contamination, and we hope that near future research can broaden our, our knowledge on this topic. And I would like to finish by thanking all co-authors of this shepherd and to you for having us and for listening to us. Thank yes, you. thank you very much. It was uh, definitely a pleasure to be invited to write this chapter, um, to work with these amazing people, very, all very good researchers. I'm humbled uh, to be working with them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ah. Thank, thank you guys. Um, such such important work. And I think you're just at the tip of the iceberg here. Lots, lots more studies to do. And so many interesting um, questions that that arise, you know, especially with the with the microplastics. I mean, I, I'm sure you've seen that that latest study that just came out by Hazen et al, with the hundreds of, of fish species that have been found. 
Um, actually, no, I'm not familiar with. Maybe Clara oh. is. Well, Clara is actually the, the lead um, researcher on the microplastics. Oh, no, maybe she in the chat. Hazen at all. Um, I, I'll um, I'll put that in the chat for you. Thank but you. Um, hundreds hundreds of species of fish, um, many of them commercial, are have been found to have microplastics in them. So it's ubiquitous. It's in our sea salt. It's in our in the placenta of our children. It's um, they're everywhere, and it's a it's a really you know it, we're shedding them off our clothing and yes. into our out of our dryers out of our washing machines and i think a lot of people it's really not on their radar that what they clothe themselves in um is having this long tail of detrimental effects mm -hmm. um and we end up eating yeah, i mean we end up yes. eating these things and um, now sunfish of course in in aren't that popular on, in Western, for, for Western consumption. And it's actually banned in Europe because um, it's part of the tetrodoniform, but you've found that they don't have tetrodotoxin. Yes. Please go ahead. Um, but it's interesting, how do you feel about that, that ban um, still being in place? And, um, well, it's, um, I think the European Commission just opted on the um, cautious side. Um, yeah. yeah. And I don't know why they don't, uh, maybe because also the MOE, they don't have a high value in, in yeah. uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they just opted for the easiest way. It's okay. We're not going to look at the scientific evidence. We're just going to, it's the same family. So let's just put it aside and not, which is a shame because we know there's a lot of bycatch and a mm -hmm. lot of oceans and fish die. So at least they could be of some use. Um, cheaper, cheaper food, for example, because if they go to waste, at least it could be used for something. Well, well, I think depending on where where they're caught, they are released alive, and that's that's True. one that's one thing about um, maybe off Spain. There's there's more mortality, but in Italy and Camogli and places like that, I know they are released from the. From the tonorella and, and other nets, so so that's one good thing about being a less frantic kind of fish. Um, they True. sort of sort of chill out in the net and can <laughs> make it out alive. <laughs> if no, I just... know the same in the, in the south of Portugal. I know that they also release them. Um, yeah, but I mean, if it's if they are uh, if in the long lines, for example, if they are cut <laughs> by the hook, maybe the stress can be too much. So I'm pretty sure that um, a lot of them will die. Yeah, yeah. So um. So I think it's, um, I, personally, I don't mind having them still be banned because then it's one well, less yeah. pressure on them. <laughs> and we need them. We need a healthy sunfish populations, but. Um, sure. And it's, I'll just chip in, even, you know, with, with bycatch and mortality, it's, it's sad, I hate it. But if, you know, if they're going back into the sea, it's still part of the system because it's kind of a weird thing with the, yeah. the, you know, the EU landings ban. It's a good thing and it's a weird thing because um, we've had the problem with all the sort of unwanted fish here that have had to be landed and the fishermen have kind of protested and gone go and then what are you going to do with it and there's huge piles of rotting fish starting to mound up at fishing ports and things like this because we can't always use them but if they go and there was a big backlash from the fishermen that they said well when we throw dead fish back it's eaten by all the scavengers and the shrimp so I yeah. don't really know what the answer is but reducing mortality is obviously obviously a good thing and yeah. I, I just wanted to add one other comment and it's 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 actually it's a bit sort of sucky uppy but I'm just wanted to say congratulations to your part of the world for somehow keeping some fish research going so well it's become a real global hub for it and it's it's seriously from the outside really impressive every time there's something weird and wacky and new it's you guys doing it and i think it's just great i think it's so it's it's actually a congratulations i think it's superb because it is a weird critter to keep working on it's not easy but you've done it better than almost anyone i know and so i think just congratulations are due for that well, thank you very much uh, i think we, we are go yeah, ahead okay, go ahead. Yeah. okay. I just to say two things and then go to the question. Uh, just to bring a, a different perspective, the, the climate change perspective that 
this, I don't want to be an advocate and let's all start eating more, not at all. But the thing is, the species distribution is changing a lot. And uh, our we have very important uh, um, species in our coast that are reaching uh, historically lows, like sardines, for example, that we consume a lot. Uh, Portugal is one of the countries in the world that eats most fish. Uh, we, I think we are in the top three or four uh, uh, countries in the world. And species are definitely um, changing. And we, we should start looking into um, rethinking the kind of species that we eat. And we have these piles and tons of, uh, of uh, putrefied uh, fish that need to be landed and then goes back to waste or to the ocean. Maybe this is a waste. and. It's just food for thought to think that in the near future, maybe uh, we should rethink this if we do not found um, biotoxins that could harm uh, humans or other trace elements that could um, somehow jeopardize well health. Maybe uh, bycatch molars would not be such a bad idea or other species. Who knows? I'm, I'm not. All right, uh, no, the one point. thing I'll add on that, because because I, I thought about not so much from that angle myself, but like if if there was commercial fisheries, to me it's where a bit more tracking, a bit more genetics can come in. Because if I think of it, even in a Mediterranean, I know you're not, but in the Mediterranean context, um, the distribution's kind of binary. It's like nothing, 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 nothing whole bunch of molar, nothing, 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 whole bunch of molar. I've always wondered if if you did ever remove a stock from somewhere, A, whose stock that is, does taking them from Morocco affect Italy, does Italy affect Spain? Um, so I, I, I'm not against your ideas. I mean, that's a pragmatic approach. It's That's the thing I'd want to know before anyone progressed in that way is if you remove from one area, what is the consequence for another area? And I don't think we're quite there yet. Tony, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I think um, local extirpation is really something to consider, you know, until we know the the health of, of the global stock. We, we really um, want to do everything we can in our power to reduce bycatch and reduce mortality until we really understand the population structure. And I, I like to um, go by... Michael Pollan's credo, which is um, eat food, mostly plants, not a lot. Um, <laughs> I think we can really lower our footprint on this planet by having a more plant-based whole food diet. Um, so, so that's that's where I will I will fall on that. <laughs> um, 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 uh, Doctor Houghton, um, I think that we are lucky in Portugal because we have access to the tuna set net. And that brings the whole possibility of a lot of fish uh, easily available. If not, you know, when you have to go to the sea, uh, some time ago I talked with uh, Dr. David Sims and he was telling me that it was very difficult to go on a boat and find an ocean sandfish. I can imagine how difficult it must be. So we have, we are just lucky to have the tuna sea pen at our disposal. Yeah, so I can tell you some silly stories of me and Tom trying to catch some fish underwater with hand nets. <laughs> And we had like a four meter pole on the hand net. So you'd see a fish and then it was like trying to move the net and the fish just swam into the net and swam away. Then we tried some fish rodeo from the boat. Um, yeah, you're right. But you've still got to have the will and the ambition and you've still got to persuade somebody to give you money for salaries. That's not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> you know? so, well, you, you, you make the most of a good opportunity. You know, and that's yes, all so. you can do. That's all you yes. can do, guys. But thank you. Thank you very much. No worries. No, it's and a again, compliment. Thank you so much uh, for inviting us and uh, for all the work in the book and uh, this symposium. It, it's just amazing. Thank you so much. I, I know Kathy feels the same. Exactly. Uh, yes. Uh, muito obrigado. Ah, <laughs> <nice>. <laughs> oh, look at that.